let's get started. My apologies um, for the technical issues. I still don't know what was going on. So um, today we're going to bring a, a couple threads together and um, also be fairly speculative at the end about uh, mapping spaces and that kind of thing. So what are those threads? Well, let's just start with a wonderful coincidence. Um, relating some of the things that we've been um, looking at. Namely, if I take, um, well, let's say this. So the first remark is that almost by construction, if I look at the iterated bar construction, and we're just going to think about the group, um, the cyclic group of order two, Zima two. So let's remember that the way I like to think about this is points in a cube labeled by group elements. But if they're, um, if they're the identity element, they kind of vanish. And so, um, so I can think about each of these that I'm picturing as labeled by the non-trivial um, uh, element. And so let um, the infiltration on it be the subspace uh, where at most, Endpoints are labeled by the um, non-trivial element in um, in the cyclic group of order two, and then the wonderful coincidence is that um, if I look at this filtration on um, on this iterated bar construction, and then I quotient those subquotients are homeomorphic to the following spaces that we've also been studying. Take configuration points in RD, this means unlabeled. So quotient by the symmetric group action, and then take the one point compactification, right? Um, right. So I'll let everybody, um, this, is, this is a, a homeomorphism. So the point is that um, in this filtration on the um, iterated bar construction, if, if a point disappears or two points collide, they're going to lower filtration. And similarly, in this one point compactification, then you, um, that's going to be uh, identified with the points at infinity. And again, you can go to infinity either by going off infinitely in one direction in RD, or two points can be colliding with one another. And so, um, so again, let me just say this means one point compactification. So this is a wonderful connection. It's only true for the cyclic group of order two. Otherwise, those subquotients, well, they're going to cover these unlabeled configuration spaces. And there's still some hay to be made there. but. But now I'm going to approach the Fox Neuwirth cell structure in a funny way, because the iterated bar construction has a cell structure associated to it. Um, again, the iterated bar construction, the bar construction was given as a uh, sort of a simplicial thing. And so if you start with a discrete set, you're just looking at a simplicial um, uh, the realization of a, of a simplicial set. And then you're iterating that and you can use those previous cell structures in the, at the next level. So there's an iterated bar cell structure and we're gonna give the picture of that as we go along. But that's gonna um, give rise to a cell structure on the ladder. cell structure on these one point compactifications. Uh, 
And um, let me just sort of say how this goes. And this has kind of been discovered, rediscovered in a number of ways. So, well, what does the iterated bar construction look like? Just formally, um, you can start naming those cells by things like this. Again, G is the non identity element of the cyclic group of order two. Right. And what is that going to be as far as a, a cell in this one point compactification? Well, in this one point compactification, I can be looking at configurations of six points. And I can demand that the first two in the dictionary order on the points. So, you know, so the standard way to do Fox and I worth is to appeal to the dictionary order on points <laughs> given by their coordinates. So this lower left point here that I just put a red line through is the first and then the one above it is the second. And then I look at the number of coordinates they share and um, and, and really, this is the observation that the iterated bar construction is given by these configurations because each of those red lines really looks like an element in the bar construction, just the, the one fold bar construction of, of um, the cyclic group of order two. This is, is of course, a picture of B2, C2. Um, let's also then, uh, neither <coughs> pictures nor the cup person bar notation is ideal for working with. So what I want to do is also talk about some numbers you can associate. One thing you can do is look at the um, depth of the, um, the bars separating the group elements. So ultimately, this is just a list of group elements, G repeated. So um, of course, I don't need to record those. But if you think about it, this is a, a lower bar, a little bar separating these two, whereas this is a, a larger bar separating the second and third Gs. I've got a larger bar separating the second and fourth Gs, one and then two other little bars. Apologies. One of those days. Um, and so this series of numbers actually determines the iterated bar name. And I'm going to um, just apply the, uh, I'm going to get a different series of numbers. Um, I'm going to look at uh, 2 minus the number in question. Um, and we'll get what? We'll get 1, 0, zero, one, one. And this tells me that the first two um, points here in this dictionary order, they share, um, so these are the number of shared coordinates. So let me color these. The, the first one is say the blue point now, and the blue and the yellow points share one coordinate. The yellow and the green points share, um, oops, green points share no coordinates. The green and the brown share no coordinates. The brown and the purple share one coordinate and the purple and the um, magenta um, share one coordinate. So these are the number of shared coordinates. That's the standard way to discuss the cell structure um, on the Fox Neuwirth um, cell structure on the one point compactification. Um, it should be said that this cell structure, uh, yes, is originally due to Fox Neuwirth in the plane, um, but you can also see it's um, work of uh, essentially Milgram came up with a version of this, Joyal and Ayala Hepworth, and more recently, 
in the context of this category theta n. So for the uh, uh, quasi categories kind of game and uh, Salvetti uh, generalized this, but this is an example of a, of a Silvetti complex. So these have been um, rediscovered for a bit, but they're deceptively simple. So I defined the, the, the cells, but let me now say that, um, so the cells are easy. But the boundaries are, are involved, they're complicated. Um, so let's give you an, an idea of why. So let's just take a simple case. Again, if we're if we're um, if I'm thinking in terms of configurations, I would say the first two points share one coordinate, second two share one. Um, the, th the third point and the fourth point share no, and the fourth point and fifth point share one. So this, and I'll leave it to you to, to think about an iterated bar. But what happens in the boundary is that I've got to think about these two lines approaching you, approaching each other. And well, there's um, lots of different combinatorics possible in terms of how these, um, how these points uh, approach each other along the lines. Ah, yes, thank you, Michael. Uh, Fuchs as well, absolutely. Um, I should have said that. Also in the plane. Um, and well, you see that all of those cases will give rise to um, to five points just uh, on a line, but there's orientations to consider. And in this case, I claim that we get uh, a factor of minus two. So there's 10 terms. I'm not gonna give you those orientations. I will post my paper with Chad Giusti where we work it out explicitly as far as I know the, oh yeah, and Vasily have also played with this, although I don't think he, um, claimed originality, but it should also be said that um, he looked at this closely. Um, so anyways, we get, we have, this is equal to minus two times the cell one, 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 one. Let me give you another example, two more examples than in this uh, notation that just I'm pulling from our paper for, um, so if I want the boundary of the cell um, two, zero, one, two. So that corresponds to, now we're in a cube at least, but I'll just draw it in the cube. Two points share two um, coordinates. So then the, they're, they're stacked on top of each other. And then um, the next point, the next two points share um, just one coordinate. So they lie in a plane, but then the last two points share two coordinates. So you get this kind of overlapping, oops, let me draw that in blue, say. Um, these last three points sit in a plane, whereas the last, very last two points, um, the very last two points then share two coordinates. So um, you, you have that uh, various points can um, quote unquote get closer uh, the, or the, 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 the linear subspaces they uh, sit on get closer to each other and, and then collide and you have to keep track of shuffles. And in this case, we get the following um, formula. Whereas the geometry of the following doesn't seem like it should be too much different, but um, you see that the coefficients and then even the number of terms vary substantially.
So it's combinatorial, but it's, um, it's not easy combinatorics. Um, but this, this is a, a cell structure that you can make some calculations in, and, and Chad and I do some of that. Um, let me, before I go elsewhere on the board, let me just say, here's a question, really a little project. Um, you know, how does the Hopfring structure on the homology of all island bird McLean spaces together um, manifest in the cell structure, or does it? So that's a question. And then the project is to really, you know, maybe revisit some point. Uh, Cartan is the one who first bravely made some calculations in this iterated bar construction. He didn't write out this um, chain complex. He was much more clever and used some um, spectral sequences essentially, and lots and lots of transgressions um, to make these calculations. But, but I think it would be nice to, to have a sort of a, a clean treatment. Great. Um, Okay, so the next thing I'm gonna do is we'll move um, up the board. And then I wanna apply duality. Okay. So, um, this will be very brief. But to bring back these um, tome co-chains that I talked about at the very beginning and have used at various points, um, if I've got a manifold not necessarily compact of dimension D, remember that we can make some co-chains by, you can think of them as embedded objects, but all you really need is a proper map um, from a co-dimension N submanifold. Well, if I then think about the one point compactification and imagine that then, well, since this is proper, I get an extension to the one point compactification of that, then um, the one point compactification uh, of, of this um, D minus N dimensional manifold will be singular, but it will have a fundamental class. And this gives rise to a homology class. And we started with a sort of a cohomology class. Um, we often call these tau w. And the point is that um, this can be used to define a duality map. Um, I haven't talked about orientations and co-orientations. I mean, W ends up being just co-oriented. If M is oriented, that also means that W is oriented, in which case I get a proper homology class and, um, and it would be in degree D minus N of, um, of N. So you can use this um, if you prove that tone classes exhaust everything. And again, here, you're not assuming that things are represented by Submanifolds necessarily, you can make these uh, general enough objects that they are, then this would be a, a, a duality map. So these were defined through um, intersection on the left and they're just through the fundamental class on the right. So how does that apply here? We get, um, Ah, uh, well, so what we say, let's take them all together. So let's look at all homology groups of all filtration subquotients of our Eilenberg McLean spaces. And um, 
Well, through these homeomorphisms, these are the same as all homology groups of um, these unordered configuration spaces, one point compactified, right? But um, a first fact, which is not that hard if you think about the, the um, this is mod two, the filtration splits, these boundary maps um, vanish. And so this is really just all of the homology of Eilenberg and claim spaces. And this by our duality is um, given by some, um, uh, sorry. Well, so configurations of endpoints in RD is an n times d dimensional manifold. And then our duality says take that minus i and look at this. Um, and now let's look at the honest configuration spaces. Now remember that these are the spaces that as d went to infinity, um, you get models for um, uh, classifying spaces of symmetric groups. So it feels a little bit odd now because I'm looking at h upper in d minus i. There's a limit that actually will change degrees um, sensibly here. But let me just say as d goes to infinity, we get bsn. So this is kind of an interesting, and this is only at the prime two, only mod two, although it does in indicate something perhaps otherwise going on an interesting relationship between the homology of Island Bergman claim spaces and the cohomology of unordered configuration spaces and thus symmetric groups because there's also um, um, homological stability. And as I said, a sensible limit here. so that you really do have the cohomology of symmetric um, groups in play. So let me, let me just explicitly show how that uh, works. Um, I'm gonna actually work from the right hand side. We can um, think about Submanifolds defined by sharing coordinates as we did for our hop ring generators. So, this is a, a generalization, but um, I will mention an important um, caveat to that. Um, but we can, we can define submanifolds uh, by sharing coordinates to. Um, to obtain co-cycles and thus um, cycles on the left-hand side. So let's, um, let's give you, let's go through one example carefully. Um, we're gonna think about uh, two points So this is inside configuration, say, of eight points in R4, two points sharing um, three coordinates, and also uh, four points sharing one coordinate, which themselves, with, uh, which break up into which then decompose as two groups of two. Which share an additional coordinate.
Okay, so the picture of that is not nearly as uh, much to digest as writing all that down. So I've got um, two points which share three coordinates. I'm going to write them over here. So this is this is inside R four. Um, so if they share three coordinates, then they just have sort of one degree of freedom left. I'll put them on the line. And then um, I also have four points which share one coordinate. Uh, and maybe indicate that by a blue plane. Oops. But they also then break up into two groups of two which share one coordinate, an additional coordinate. And then notice I've only drawn six points here. So there's an additional two somewhere that could be um, to the left or right uh, or in between um, these two. Okay, so, um, and let me also indicate that, um, well first, let's just make this very clear that the, the for um, two points sharing three coordinates is what I've indicated in red. Um, four points sharing one coordinate, which is then what I've indicated in purple, and then the two groups of two sharing an additional coordinate is what I'm um, indicating with those purple lines there. So first, um, so that's the in the geometry of the configuration space. First, uh, I claim that this is um, easy to translate into a corresponding uh, fox neuwirth cycle. Um, namely, so for example, the two points sharing three coordinates, if they came first, then I'd have a three in the name for the cycle, because that's how many coordinates they share. And then I'd have some other points, and maybe I do the four points which share one. But then, because they break up into two groups of two that share one, in fact, I should put twos here. And then the other two points are, um, uh, free. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So they can be where they want. And you can make a cycle by shuffling these. So I don't really care whether the three, whether the two points which share three coordinates comes first or later. And similarly for, um, if I was being systematic, there would be some other terms before this, but. But this is another possibility um, that describes that those occurrences, but without uh, caring what order those points come in in the Fox Neuwirth order. And the remarkable thing about the the Fox Neuwirth um, cell complex, and thus um, you know the prime two, the iterated bar construction cell complex, is that these I'll call this a a sort of a block symmetrization. of blocks themselves, which have the sort of a two symmetry to them, these um, uh, span all of the homology classes. Um, and of course, now this is uh, readily gives you the picture and it's the same picture for a homology class in, um, in B in the uh, KZ24. So in this case, what we get is a, um, um, well, the easier thing, because I'm using Fox Neuwirth cells, um, is that I'm describing an element in H upper eight of uh, the configurations, unordered configurations of eight points in R4. But under this isomorphism, that's an element of H lower. 24, which is 32 minus 8, of kz mod 2, 4. Um, and 
Yeah, there's this wonderful dictionary bit between the two that um, I don't think has been fully mined, so to speak. Um, in fact, let me give a little, um, and, and, and how would you see this 24? Well, you start counting degrees of freedom, right? Um, let's, so here we would have eight degrees of freedom for the two free points. Um, the two points that share um, three coordinates, you have eight degrees of freedom for one and then one for the other. Is that already? Um, Oh no, not eight degrees of freedom. It's we're in R4. <laughs> so four degrees of freedom for each of the free points. Um, uh, five degrees of freedom for these. Here, one would have four degrees of freedom. The other would have um, plus two plus three plus two, I think, what's that? Yes, that is 24, how about that? Um, so you can just count degrees of freedom. And these are the homology classes of island brain McLean spaces, or equivalently the cohomology classes of, um, well, unordered configuration spaces, but, but through homological stability, symmetric groups. Let me, let me put a, a, a sort of a question slash observation, so this is, a relationship between homology of eilenberg mclean spaces and cohomology of symmetric groups, essentially. Um, you, I wonder, <laughs> so question or observation, really, um, if I can play the game the other way. So let's look at uh, one of my favorite classes is an H3 of in order of configurations of four points, say just in the plane. And we drew, we drew a picture like this a few times last lecture. So here's a three-dimensional homology class. Um, the parameters to sort of tell you where things are in their orbital system. So it's an RP1 wreath, RP1 cross RP1. That's exactly the kind of thing we talked about last time. And so that's going to give some class in H upper five. Um, B2, C2, so the, um, uh, the de-looping of RP infinity, the thing that re represents second homology. And I think that I'm pretty sure that under this, it it's square two on square one on the fundamental class. But um, yeah, this is a, this is a story. Has, this is some geometry now you can associate to Steenrod squares again, and that's very much um, at the prime two. The other thing to say here is um, um, you know what? Did I start on the second board? I did. It is one of those days. Let me um, switch boards and start there. So um, the other thing to say is that these um, uh, representatives of cohomology arising from these Fox Miller cells Um, really have a, a Schubert style interpretation as characteristic classes. So what can we do? Let's, let's take the one that we were looking at before. Um, again, two points share three coordinates and four points share one coordinate. And that was for um, eight points. So suppose um, we have an eight sheeted cover. 
So what, what do I mean by Schubert style? Well, we didn't uh, discuss this too much because uh, I didn't give an exhaustive treatment of characteristic classes of vector bundles, but there what you do is you embed your vector bundle in a trivial bundle in the Schubert uh, way, and then you look at um, different ways your vector space can intersect, say the standard flag. And then that defines some um, submanifolds of your space if you want, which again, through this, uh, these tome classes represent cohomology classes. So, so now let's suppose we have um, a, an eight sheeted cover or something like that. And I can then embed it in Y cross R4, perhaps. So suppose I can. And then I can count when discrete, when it really is something to count, um, the number of, um, well, sorry. Let me put it this way then consider the submanifold of y over which so the point is that every fiber in every fiber i've just got eight points and so we can say over which, say, um, two points share three coordinates, our favorite little example, four points share one coordinate and also break into two sets of two. This submanifold is going to be a codimension eight submanifold of, um, of y. assuming some transversality. So that means I've got a class in H upper eight. And that's a characteristic class of this finite sheeted cover. So, so yeah, covering just like vector bundles have characteristic classes. Covering spaces have characteristic classes if I fix a number of sheets. And um, our calculation of cohomology symmetric groups gives those, that's sort of general principles. But the nice thing is that these uh, Fox Neuwirth representatives um, give rise to um, sort of a very geometric Schubert flavor for those characteristic classes. Let me put an open question now. Can these uh, be extended? So um, let me just talk a, a minute about the Barrett pretty um, and then you get two other big names who came in and enhanced the theorem. But just the Barrett Pretty theorem says that, well, I mean, BS infinity, they give a way that you can make this into um, something you would call loops infinity, S infinity. Um, and so, and then this is, this they show is a homology isomorphism. That's the very pretty part. Uh, making that a uh, more refined statement was the Quill and Siegel part. <coughs> but we can now say, well, it's a homology isomorphism and a cohomology or isomorphism. We now know what the, uh, we know characteristic classes geometrically here. Now, um, the question is, what are they here? In other words, how could I explicitly measure, given a covering space, I measure it by counting the number of points satisfying various um, conditions. Now, instead of a covering map, I've got a map from a sphere to sphere. If it happens to be the image of the Pontryagin, under Pontryagin Tom of some covering map, then great, I know how to evaluate that, but the inclusion goes the wrong way. The map and cohomology would go from the right-hand side. And, and so, 
And the reason I care about this is that this um, an answer would lead to a similar description for the cohomology of a stable mapping class group, cohomology of, um, well, it's, I'm probably mostly talking to experts now anyway, but something called MTSO2, the stable um, uh, surface bundles, stable digenus. So in other words, characteristic classes that exist for surfaces of any genus, we've calculated those through some remarkable work of Galatius, Madsen, Tillman, Weiss, uh, folks like that. Um, but if I say gave you a, 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 a high dimensional genus surface bundle over a space and I wanted to understand its characteristic classes, there's nothing close to that in the literature. So here's, uh, here's something that if we could, um, through the machinery, if, if um, well, the Barrett Pretty Quill and Siegel theorem is, is often now in modern view thought of as a zero dimensional uh, version of it. So a covering space is like a manifold bundle with a zero manifold fiber. And surface bundles, of course, are manifold bundles with two dimensional fibers. So, and it turns out that the same machinery um, that uh, leads, that can be proved, leads to the proof of the um, Galatian, Smash, and Tillman Weiss theorem can be used to prove the very pretty Quill and Siegel theorem, but it also then sort of indicates how, um, how the, the geometry of, of, of the zero dimensional case would uh, play a role in the geometry of the two dimensional case. All right, then let me also give you a warning um, because this is, needs to be in um, an erratum, something stated but not proven. So in the Fox Neuwirth, so let's just say in, not in the Fox Neuwirth original paper, but our paper on um, Fox Neuwirth cells, we assume, but don't prove, that um, the diagrams one can associate to to these um, uh, co-cycles um, agree with their skyline diagram representatives. Um, so our example of, I'm again, oops. Our favorite example that we keep on picking on, sorry, let me. Once in a while, the, I hit something on the board that I shouldn't. So, so our favorite little example where we look at um, uh, two points, share three coordinates, four points, share one, and break up into two groups, which each share one. Well, there's a natural little skyline diagram that you could make for that, this one. And, um, and, 
And the, 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 the point is that this in general, this will differ from the, um, the Hopfring element from the, what you would want to be the corresponding Hopfring element. In other words, there's two ways that one can um, produce cohomology in the cohomology of symmetric groups from a skyline diagram, one using the Hopfring presentation, another using Fox Neuwirth geometry. And alas, there's a, there's a change of basis. Um, they, 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 they don't agree. Here's a, a first case where this happens is this class cubed, because remember the gamma one, one, one case where they do correspond are the, the basic gammas, um, sorry, gamma one, two means um, that I've got two sets of um, two points, each of which share one coordinate. That's great, but that ends up not being um, the, the, well, as a hop ring, in the hop ring, it is immediately represented by this, but it's not equal to the geometric class where I have two sets of two points which share three coordinates. Um, so that's kind of an unfortunate uh, fact of nature and something that, that my collaborators and I should work out one of these days. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to now switch to uh, mapping spaces. Um, I said there's a lot of different threads from these lectures that uh, we're going to let me go further to the... There's a lot of different threads that, um, that can be, that can come together. From early on, um, I think in the catch-up tome co-chain um, uh, lecture, so let's recall the bar construction, which we've been using more for BG, uh, first for us, um, well, arises for the cochains of loops of a manifold. Um, let me recall how that goes. So we have that, for example, we've got tau w1 bar tau w2, et cetera. There's a cochain that we can associate um, and, and now it would have to be the sorry. There's a tome coaching that you can associate there, which it will be of the, the following form. We're going to think about the submanifold of loops M such that, um, sorry, of, of loops. such that there are um, times with gamma of T1 in W1, et cetera. So, um, So 
So the picture is that we we have our W1s, W2s, etc. And they're almost like a little jungle gym. So if I've got my ambient manifold here, and then I'll picture the W's in green, then my gammas, my loops are, I'm asking, okay, do I go first through W1 and then W2? And if I do, then um, that I can think of that as a submanifold of the space of loops. Um, by adjointness, treat it as such and define some, um, some chains by these conditions on families. So, um, so let me state it as a conjecture now that these Fox Neuwirth ideas uh, translate there. I'm sure somebody um, has likely followed through on this, but I don't even know a reference that would really give this explicitly. So conjecture is that we can use Fox Neuwirth uh, cells with labels in in cochains or sub-manifolds in M to model the default loops, well, the cochains on the default loops of M. So how would that go? Well, at this point, I think folks could see if I'm gonna think about a map from um, a, a default loop, as a map from a cube modulo its boundary to M, then um, I've got my W1, my W2, I've got my Fox Neuwirth um, cell, but now every point is labeled by a submanifold, and that gives you a submanifold of the loop space. Um, namely, and I just say that there is um, uh, a collection of time, uh, a collection of points in the cube uh, respecting this Fox Neuwirth geometry so that the first one goes to, uh, I should have um, switched my W1 and W2, but you get the point that um, the first point goes to W1, the second point goes to W2, et cetera, et cetera. And that then there's a, a, a way to get at the cohomology of the iterated loop space then through a, a chain complex that, that mixes the um, Fox Neuwirth uh, boundary along with, of course, the intersection in, um, in M. Um, so let me say a couple more things and then I'll wrap it up. Um, because what it, so this, th that's iterated loop space theory. What about for general domains? There's something called the Anderson spectral sequence, um, but I wanted to, to share some of the geometry there. Um, for general domains, of course, you don't have um, that geometry, but let's assume like say, um, uh, well, Let's just say simplicial complex. Um, let's just give go right to an example. So for every two simplex, for any two simplex in X, let's fix some number K and um, and then I'm going to uh, choose K choose two submanifolds manifolds. We'll just call them W, I, J. And what we can do is for um, 
T1 less than or equal to T2 less than or equal to TK, I'm going to think about where um, I'm going to look at pairs. Uh, I'm taking the standard simplex where it's, um, well, in the, in the two-dimensional case, I'm going to look at sort of the x less than or equal to y's. So this is the point t1, t2, t1, t3, et cetera. And then um, at that point, I'm going to think of that as labeled by w1, 2. And this is labeled by w1, 3, et cetera. This would be labeled by um, w3, uh, 4. And I look at the space of all maps, which when I restrict to that simplex, send some configuration of, in this case, six points, for choose two points, to these six submanifolds. Um, with in, in, for, the, for some choice of uh, times t1, t2, t3, and t4 in that case. So this is again now some kind of submanifold object of uh, um, uh, mapping space. So we can, so asking that there exists T1 through TK such that F sends TI, TJ to WIJ inside my ambient manifold M. This defines a submanifold of um, not loops anymore. Now this is maps from X to M. Over all simplices of X, this defines a series of submanifolds. And this is exactly what's um, uh, what uh, you look at the combinatorics of this and it's what's called the Anderson spectral sequence for mapping spaces, which is very formal, but now we see it through the geometry of uh, configurations. Let me finally say that if you've got a, a sequence of submanifolds, let's even think back in the loop space case up here, if you've got a sequence of submanifolds uh, or set of submanifolds so that M is contractible when you remove them, then it makes intuitive sense that keeping track the crossings with, with the WI really that should uh, determine the homotopy type of the loop space. So, um, but again, I don't know of any proofs along those lines for either the classical Ionberg Moore or this um, higher dimensional iterated uh, bar kind of um, construction for, for homology of iterated loop spaces. And by the way, I should have said that um, this, this model is only, you only expect them to be good for, um, here, let me write it with um, the less than the connectivity of M. If that isn't the case, then, well, I don't think you would expect really the geometry of, of single points labeled by submanifolds to suffice from some of the same ideas that, um, that came up in our Hopf invariant work, you would start thinking about, say, one, uh, in, let, let's think about the, the loops DM, one manifolds inside your box uh, labeled by submanifolds in, in M, or two manifolds, or other things which um, we can reduce to points basically only because generically you don't uh, hit the submanifolds and um, and so then the first time you do, you're just keeping track of, of where in the domain you do. So, um, and as far as I know, there's, there's very, very little work on, on those kinds of models for mapping spaces. But those are the kinds of things that I, I think about from this uh, point of view. Okay, I started late, but I think I ended it at about an hour. Um, I am going to, uh, well, First we'll do questions as usual, and then I'll stop the um, uh, recording. Dev, could you say about the next few um, talks, what times or how, how it's just gonna go?
So, so, um, so the next few talks, um, yeah, so I, I, I announced the times. It's just tomorrow and Wednesday. It's again, more for the people who are um, uh, watching on, on, on recording or anticipated more, but very happy to have folks. So that's just tomorrow at nine and 11, and then Wednesday at nine, if I remember correctly. And um, we're gonna do a switch to um, calculus of embeddings and, and, and a little bit of the applications uh, in knot theory, which is, as, as you know very well, near a, a, a longstanding project of mine. Um, but the nice, the fun thing is that these mapping space models that I just talked about today end up um, rationally being uh, what you find for embeddings. So, um, so this was a kind of a good transition lecture, even though the next topics will start fairly differently, but we'll in fact see some familiar friends, configuration spaces, uh, Hopf invariants, and these mapping space models all coming in there. So that's part of why I wanted to finish off on that topic, but just for personal reasons, decided to try to do that this week. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, all right, I'm going to stop.